Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions Daily. Today, Monday, uh, fresh from the USA, we have Kian Gulzari. Today, we're going to be talking about sourcing in the pandemic. There's a series of things, a series of things sorry, we're going to go over. But in the meantime, for those who, uh, who are not sure, who could Kian, can you uh, give everyone a little bit of background on yourself? Sure, yeah. How's it going, guys? My name is Kian Gozari from Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, I've been living and working in China for the past 10 years. Uh, in that time, I've developed over 2,500 products, uh, visited over 500 different factories, uh, been to 20 different Canton fairs, uh, so a wide variety of experience in China. And uh, basically, my background of sourcing and product development, I've managed to manufacture products for the NBA, NFL, United Nations, uh, Olympics, as well as big box retailers here in the UK, Europe and the USA, and then as well as helping Amazon private label sellers as well. So uh, with everything that's going on in China right now, it's sort of changing day by day. So I just sort of wanted to jump on with Danny and give you guys the latest of uh, what I think is going on in China and how we can use that to our, our advantage, what opportunities are going on and uh, how we can adapt basically. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. So kicking off first thing, let's talk about lead times. Sure. Yeah. I mean, lead times are going to be quite heavily affected by this virus for a number of different reasons. And it purely depends on like, you know, what sort of category of product uh, that you're in, because first of all, the virus happened at a time of Chinese New Year, which is the biggest people migration in the world. So remember that like a lot of the workers which were going back to their factories may not have actually gone back there just because of a uh, travel situation with the virus, but also because of now like what sort of products are in demand as a result of the virus. So you can imagine that, you know, like travel products like a neck pillow will be way down compared to like, you know, kids STEM toys, like educational toys, anything from the home, which will be way up. So yeah. as a result, their production lines are gonna be far busier. They're gonna pay workers a higher salary and then they're gonna have like way more workers. But then that like, say like the travel category, which has been deeply affected, there's no orders on their production line to keep all the workers that they had last year. So yeah. as, as a result, their lead times could, um, could increase because they don't have the capacity that they had last year. Um, so definitely just check in with the manufacturers to see, you know, what's the latest on their side and um, how that will affect their lead times. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing to also remember is that it was a really crazy situation when Corona first broke out because it was only China that was affected, right? Mm -hmm. And then we all started freaking out to say, all right, are the factories going down? Let's get our orders in. Let's order fast uh, before like this affects all of us. And then so everyone put in big orders and then Corona hit in the rest of the world and then as a result of hitting in the rest of the world then the global demand for our products went down and then people started cancelling orders yes. so like china had a big surge in orders then it had a big cancellation in orders and where this could be an opportunity for you is that well when they got those big surge of orders in the first place they might have already gone ahead and prepared a lot of raw materials they might have already gone in bulk uh, ordered a lot of stock which you so know they don't I can need interject, if people put down their 30 percent the weighted their four to six weeks or whatever their lead time was Whilst yeah. that pandemic kicked off worldwide, they cancelled orders, they lost their deposits, say, but that only leaves the factory with raw material. They've still got their running costs, their overheads, they've still got to run machinery, still got to pay for staff. Therefore, yeah. they're in a better position to negotiate with them other than that they are sitting on top of raw materials and may be able to broker better deals, is what you're saying. Exactly, yeah. So yeah. you just want to check in with them to see, like, do they have anything in stock? And then as a result... Uh, they might give you some materials at a cut price just because they want to get rid of it. And then yeah. the other thing is that, like, let's say you're ordering something that doesn't require much development, like, I don't know, a pair of scissors or something like that. They might have stock of, like, 50000 which was, like, cancelled for someone else. So you could just jump in and get them at a lower price. Mm -hmm. So depending on what your products are, if they're ready-made or if they require development, check to see if they have materials in stock that they're trying to now get rid of at a cheaper price or if they actually have finished goods in stock, which are, which are trying to get rid of at a, at a cheaper price as well. Yeah. No, that makes sense. What other what other things, uh, patterns have you seen with that in terms of negotiations, in terms of your power of negotiation? You're very knowledgeable about what you do. You, you, you've got a lot of respect in the community and stuff. What other things have you seen in terms of um, the nuances of some of the negotiations that you've done? 
Well, the thing is, like, I think here communication is key uh, because it, we should be very open book because like we always with the Chinese, we want to work in partnership. You know, work, yeah. what works for you guys works for us. And it's like they've been trying to help us as much as possible uh, at certain times when we needed it. And we should also try and help them uh, when they need it. So I just feel like the, the better relationship you have, the more open and honest you are with each other. And then when they need your support, they will let you know and they'll pass on savings to you wherever they can as well. So yep. some some of them might actually be quite stuck in the like in certain categories of product where they don't have as much orders and they can't keep the workers. They could actually go out of business. Mm -hmm. um, and and another thing that we're going to see because you know uh, businesses here are at risk uh, of going under, and as a result, that could happen to them as well. And um, I, I think that's going to affect how we see things on like Alibaba as well because you, you know there's a lot of middlemen on alibaba who just quite often take images from amazon listings post on alibaba try to get the order and then they find the factory well mm -hmm. now that the demand is down so much like they're not going to be as present on alibaba anymore mm -hmm. but so you're going to see like more sort of authentic factories on alibaba but then to flip reverse that as a result of everyone getting laid off and being at home you know now they're sort of taking courses of learning how to sell online and then there's going to be a surge in demand on alibaba as well so yeah. it's very volatile like same with the factories the orders went up now they went down it's going to be the same on alibaba so th this is why like communication is key uh, mm -hmm. honesty is key relationships are key like all those times that you spent you know talking to your manufacturers and building those relationships this is where it's going to come into play and where mm -hmm. you can really benefit from them yeah, makes sense. I'm going to say some hellos. Uh, Baptiste, Ben Valance, uh, Peter Greenwood. Uh, who else we got here? Amy Weiss, welcome back. Tiffany, uh, Anka, Alexander, Abdul, Adam, Billy McDowell. Welcome, guys. If you've got any questions for Kieran, uh, Kieran, sorry, that's, that's the second time today I've called you Kieran. Kieran. Yeah. Right, Tiffany says, yeah, good morning, guys. Obviously, yeah, where you are, I think this is 8 a.m. Tiff, isn't it? Uh, welcome back to the show. Um, let's go on to the topic of masks. We've covered it a bit on the show before, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. but what are you seeing out there at the moment? Because this is a daily update with FD, FDA approval, yeah, acceptance of masks, and KN95s are okay. No, they're not. Yes, they are. Depends on the territory, getting pulled in at customs. What are we looking at? Yeah, masks is such a crazy topic, isn't it? Because like there's such a global demand for that now as well. And yeah. I think that like a lot of manufacturers have now pivoted into making masks as well, just because they can't get enough of it. And if mm -hmm. you think about the construction of a mask, it's just cut and sew. So yeah. anyone who, any factory that was making like say a backpack is also cut and sew. So mm -hmm. now that they know that they just can't get enough of them, now they're sort of gravitating towards those products. So like some of my manufacturers have told me, now yeah. we're manufacturing masks and yeah. hopefully it's just a short term thing. but. So, so that's the thing. Now, now there's a lot of more, a lot more masks in circulation, and as a result, there's a lot of brands that we know as well, uh, both like new brands, established brands, who are also making masks using their resources. Like for example, I just saw an ad in my newsfeed today. Like New Balance, the shoe company, uh, are are now making masks, uh, and it's an honourable and an admirable thing. But it's very, very important to make sure that these masks like pass the regulations and. Yeah stipulate what you're making because it's obviously the n95s which are the proper regu regulatory masks but mm. other masks are still effective not yeah. as effective as an n95 but mm. it's very important to say like what type of masks you're producing and what they're capable of are they reusable are they washable uh, or is it a one-time use and mm. then um and then and getting those masks to the people who need it and now there's two different things we can say with masks like okay are you making it to sell it as a profit in your business or are you just making it to send it out to help whoever needs it like are you getting it at a cheap price from your factory to donate to hospitals or yeah. is this something that you're now you're opportunistic and you're trying to make a profit out of mm. uh so it, i'm sort of seeing like two, two different ways of doing it and um and if we look yeah. at the uh, as well if like a lot of people that take out the you know masks like the the ones the high-end masks your kns in your 95s you know mm. they are in terms of you need me some level of medical knowledge to understand, or at least your factory does, or the your sourcing partner, don't you agree? And so a yeah. lot of people are doing a smash and grab, grabbing the masks. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them is if they're not being inspected, you think amount of Amazon sellers that still send shit into Amazon, <laughs> like crazily sit, like they'll do a shipment, do, I don't know, bring over a, a, a container for, and they don't spend 300 quid on, the, on a, on a, 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 what's it called? The inspection. What about yeah. the, what about these masks? They've got to meet some sort of level of regularity, like regulation, sorry. So yeah. 
do you see in it as well at the moment? What I'm seeing is a, there's a market awash with all different types of masks, but mm-hmm. then there's a level of red tape where a lot of people, like they're, they've been pulled, the distribution points, you know, they're pulling them off Amazon, they're pulling mm-hmm. them off um, various different stores. I know people can sell them on their own stores, but I don't think you can run PPC ads on them anymore as yeah, well. I, ad I, work, I, do you know what I mean? Yeah, you know what's crazy as well is that Trump actually banned the import of masks is into America as well. Like I think three or uh, quite a few days ago, because right. there was a lot of masks coming in and they didn't really know. Okay, what's in regulation and what's not, and it's it was getting quite hard to inspect it. So he just banned it all together, and then he overturned that about three days ago because he realized okay whatever type of masks they are we do need them so then yeah. now he got them back in and a lot yeah. of people were asking me oh hey do you know a good mask supplier i want to get into masks and i was like it's so volatile right now anyway mm-hmm. that you don't even know if you can import it into this country and you don't even know if you can like properly sell it on amazon either but mm-hmm. that's a very good point about pre-shipment inspections as well one it's important to know like what type of masks you're ordering but then also whatever else you're manufacturing like your core products mm-hmm. now is a very very important time to do pre-shipment inspections as well just yeah. because of what we talked I don't about think earlier. there's any I don't think there's never not a good time to do a pre-shipment I've yeah. never shipped never ever shipped yeah. without a pre-shipment inspection I mean you get them as low even the ship ones at 188 a day that's yeah. got better than nothing but it goes back to the point with masks as well something is better than nothing I'd mm-hmm. rather if someone has a scarf around their face I know it's not ideal but that yeah. gives a small white layer of protection of others maybe reduce yeah. spitting distance and stuff like that as long yeah. as you've got some cover but is i think we've got this problem now where we've got all of these masks we've got the red tape and there's no points of distribution mm-hmm. so wh- where where's that and, th- and then there's still that demand out there that people can't get them so what do you do yeah and it's very interesting for the consumer to understand what they're buying as well because people yeah. are just sort of thinking oh i need to get a mask but they don't actually know what type of masks they need to get so mm-hmm. just for everyone out there the n95 N, yeah, N95 is the official sort of one that's just really going to, it really covers uh, y- your face and doesn't really allow much uh, to go outside. But mm. I'll tell you, I, I had an N95, at N95 and I was wearing it on the plane back home and it was the first time I was wearing it and it was so bloody uncomfortable. Like it's it horrible. was yeah. so like on the on the bridge of your nose, there's so much pressure on it. Actually, I've got one mm. here. Um, yeah. So like there's this like little metal plate that goes over the top yeah. and um, like, underneath it is just this like little foam bit, right? And Honestly, after an hour, my nose was in so much pain. I had to take it off just to give my nose a rest. Hmm. And then, and you was... end up touching your face as well. So if yeah. you haven't cleaned your hands, that's the problem, isn't it? So yeah. this is like, like I know when I spoke to you in HS, they're, they're focused on visors now. So everyone's yeah. doing masks. Yeah. But the next move is everyone wants visors. I mean, masks is obviously you need something, but yeah. ideally, if they meet the um, the PPE requirements, they've been yeah. they've been asked for visors. You know? So it was, in, it was interesting because I had a bandana in my head in my hand luggage. I don't know why I had a bandana on me, but I did. Uh, and I basically just took off the mask and used the bandana, put it over and just flipped it and tied it. And it, that yeah. was way more comfortable. But mm. so if, if you are going to buy an N95 mask, just understand it is uncomfortable. So yeah. maybe have something else on you as well in case you have to take it off. Cool. Just want to say a few more hellos. So Michelle Bray's here. Andrew Kramer. Chris Parr is watching Otter Kelm uh ben koek welcome back guys phil rivet has just joined us and tiff up on the screen i'm glad you guys are covering this so many think a scarf is sufficient again clear clarity i'm not saying it is sufficient but it's better than nothing but still not great right would you agree yeah 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 yeah. cool um staying on mask then FDA mm-hmm. approval. What if, what's the latest from you? We kind of discussed uh, discussed this last week. We had some legal eagles on Paul and um, and Jeff was on the show last week. Any new movements this this week in different territories about what type of marks are acceptable, what's not? I, I'm I'm not sure about the legalities of it. I only sort of go by the N95. Uh, but I know that there are like a lot of new ones sort of popping up, and there's a lot yeah. of branded ones popping up as well. So. I just, I don't know, it, it, it's really hard to say. I would just say test it yourself yeah. and uh, just make sure you know what you're purchasing as well because, like, you know you get those, like, the, the pack of 50, which are, like, the paper thin, the one-time use. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, th- they're very cheap, but some people are selling them for, like, $30 trying to mm. make you think it's, like, a, a proper regulatory mask that you can reuse and things like that. So, yeah. as a consumer, just understand uh, what yeah. you're purchasing and do your research as well. Yeah. Um, one one more thing as well is that like I know a lot of suppliers you know they want to help out and a lot of my suppliers have reached out and said hey can we send you some masks and it's mm-hmm. not like we're making them it's like 
we've got sources in China, we've got a lot of masks here and we want to send it to you and your company uh, mm. to hand out to your employees. It's very kind of them. Uh, yeah. And I've had a lot of them reach out and we've actually got masks here, so we're okay. But what I ended up doing was, um, I do have um, VAs in the Philippines and I was speaking to them. I was like, do you guys have masks? They're like, no, no, we don't. And it's mm. really breaking out here. So I got like a, a, a few boxes, a few hundred masks and I sent them to my VA in the Philippines for her family mm. and her friends and to distribute yeah. there. So I think just- if I've you done have, the same. Yeah, I yeah, don't. I remember actually, we were talking about it. But yeah, before, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you got to look after people. At the end, of, I got my exactly. VAs to buy them up and distribute two and a half thousand across orphanages and um, schools and stuff. You know, yeah. Nice, that's awesome. Got to do your little bit anyway. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes. There's a question on the screen from Michael Schneider. I think it is. Have you discussed the product liability that may come with selling masks and visors? This is a really good point because my donor matching thing I'm doing where I'm matching donors in the UK that donate the masks to me. They go to a free PL and then we get them out to NHS frontline people. But I had to get my legal guy to do a disclaimer because I could get sued or they could get sued by providing free masks to people. Do you see what I mean? So it could turn on you. So we had to get a disclaimer. So we've done a form so that people click on that and then we were able to send it out to people. What's your take on the liability side of things? It's it, it's very very important. Like, and I think that goes back to the pre shipment inspection as well. Because mm. like, even even if your manufacturers have the best interest at heart, they mm. might not know what they're actually making mm. uh, if they're doing this for the first time. Like a lot of them, are, like I said, are pivoting towards this, and they might say, "Oh yeah, this is N95 or this is something mm. else." But just make sure it's backed up by a third party inspection company. The 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 re reliable companies I I work with are like Intertech, SGS, uh, mm. BV. And those companies, like they'll know exactly what's going on, uh, and they'll be able to test it to, to the correct standards to make sure you know what you're actually getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Florin um, here says I sent 250 masks from Australia to one of my suppliers in China back in early February. So he sent them back the other way. And I know we're me? speaking to uh, Florin as well. One of the reasons behind the mask shortage, uh, material shortage, was all the Australian fires. That's right. That's right. That's one of the reasons behind that as well. Um, something I read the other day as well, because we talk about price gorging and stuff like that. Apparently, um, the material costs of masks now, what, you know, what makes up the composite of these uh, these materials, it's like it's increased 90 percent the costs. So obviously that's been passed on to the person, mm -hmm. you know, who's, who's obviously purchasing those masks. So I think there's a mix of a couple of things here where there's gorging. And mm -hmm. sheer demand is forcing up the, the net price of the mask. Yeah, I, I think you'll get gouging at, at every level. And it's interesting, mm -hmm. like when this whole thing like first broke out and it started to get really serious uh, mm -hmm. outside of China, I got put into all these like different WhatsApp WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups, and they were like, hey, you can use uh, help us source masks, can you help us sell masks? Mm -hmm. And then all these middlemen just appeared out of nowhere. Like they, they know someone who knows someone who knows someone and everyone's adding on their margin. And yeah. it's like one like you should use your connections to help but this mm. is not the time to just make a quick buck you know this mm. is the time to really get masks out as fast as possible but it's like w when the prices go up like this it's kind of like i don't know it, it makes it difficult for the people who really need it and then it makes it more expensive for everyone who needs it as well mm. yeah that makes total sense um okay so i think we have pretty much covered quite heavily here on mars let's move over um let's talk about the Trump tariffs, what, revisit that. What's going on there at the moment? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I think this is important to talk about because I saw a lot of fake news going around on Facebook. And yeah. it, it was actually, um, it was a Wall Street Journal that published something to say that because of everything that's going on in China uh, mm -hmm. and with coronavirus and how this has affected uh, global trade, uh, Trump is now going to like go back on the tariffs and he's going to reduce them and he's going to get rid of them in certain categories. And the Wall Street Journal actually published that article which is crazy and i was like oh this sounds awesome let me check the categories and then as i looked into it uh, there was like a news reporter that said to trump uh, in a one-to-one -one interview in a live interview was like oh what's happening with the wall street journal article is like that's fake news because i never said that before there's no changes on the tariffs uh, but it was already blasted all over facebook so just be uh, it, it should be known that there's no changes to the tariffs um and trump hasn't made any changes as of yet it, that and with everything this is all like a day-to-day -day thing isn't it so i think um just keep checking in and see what happens. But as we know it, there's not been any change to tariffs. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, moving on then. So what's going on with Alibaba at the moment? Yeah, yeah. So as, as I mentioned earlier, like it, it's interesting because there, Alibaba exists. There's a lot of middlemen and that's how it can get a bad reputation. And I think there's just such a lack of demand in certain categories. And, and I think that on Alibaba, you'll see the shift towards the hand sanitizers, the masks, the hazmat suits and stuff like that. And what's dangerous is that 
a lot of people are now going into these sort of products because there's such a high demand for it. But with anything, now there's just crazy competition. So yeah. one, just make sure you're buying from a, a reputable supplier if you are buying on Alibaba. Mm -hmm. And also understand this could be a short-term thing because the market could get absolutely flooded. And one one good thing to check on Alibaba to make sure you're not just buying off um, a, a middleman is that when you go on their Alibaba profile, check how many years they've been selling on Alibaba because mm -hmm. sometimes they can say like, one year or it can say five years or it can say 10 years and obviously anyone who's only been selling for you know less than one year has just jumped in to try and take advantage of this opportunity so you mm -hmm. want to find the ones which have been um manufacturing this product for a long time and then the other thing you can do if you can see someone who's manufacturing masks you can also go into the alibaba profile and check out what other products they sell and if yeah. their other products are like a massage gun a nail clipper you, you know then you just know they're all over the place but if mm -hmm. all the products are just medical products then you know that they're a reliable supplier so just yeah. do your uh, due diligence on alibaba as well if you are going to be sourcing any of these items yeah uh quick one here so be a supplier i've had for five years which i would regularly inspect and trusted them has just sent me the worst pile of shit ever <laughs> all written off lucky on the 100 percent after delivery lesson inspection every single time that's mm. absolutely true when your yeah. suppliers much as they're lovely will turn around and say don't worry about the 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 quality we got you, that is when you should be running a mile and panicking because it should yeah. be standard to have an inspection, yeah. And it's exactly at this time that suppliers are in a little bit of trouble. Uh, like yeah. I said, like their workers are not returning back after Chinese New Year. They're not getting mm. the orders they were getting in. So maybe if they're not a re reliable supplier and if you don't have a good relationship with them, they're just sort of using this to gain additional margin on their order and they do that by sort of supplying you inferior goods. Yeah. And oh yeah, and the thing is, I don't think people is culturally is different, so they don't. It's not necessarily the owner of the factory; it's the turnover of staff. They haven't got to. It's, they're not worried about the care. They're just trying to get through their day, right, and do their job. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if they screw up an order, they don't look. Then then people working in the factory are not necessarily looking at the long term interest of the relationship of the of the uh, the supply that the boss at the factory, and obviously you as the customer as well. Um, exactly. How this is an interesting one. We spoke about this off call, um, and I'm not sure how many people know this, but let's talk about how the whole virus thing started and the use mm -hmm. of technology. This is fascinating. Yeah, so I thought this was amazing. So obviously, when this whole virus situation hit our side of the world a lot more seriously, I started to call a lot more friends in China to be like, all right, how did you guys deal with it? How long did it really really last? How were your hospitals really affected? All this sort of stuff, just to try and get gain an insight into what we were going to experience. Mm -hmm. And what was really surprising to me is that like, I never saw anything about this like talked about on the media, but as anyone who's knows China well knows that they all use WeChat. WeChat is their application, which is their social media, and it's what they use to pay for things. And it's very much like our Google and Facebook that they they, they know where you are at all times. They, they, they track your phone, they monitor your phone, they know who you're interacting with, they know your locations, all that sort of stuff. And basically like, anyone who's been tested for the coronavirus and they're tested a positive they operate like a traffic light uh, system it's like red amber green if you're a red that means you've been tested for the virus and you're tested positive so like mm -hmm. you're not supposed to go anywhere and if you're amber it means that you've been in proximity to someone who's been tested positive recently so for example if you're in a bread shop and um you've sold someone bread, you own your own bread shop, and someone who's come in and bought bread from you and they got tested positive two days later, you then get a notification on your phone saying that someone came into your shop two days ago and they're positive for the virus. You are now self-quarantined for 14 days and you're now a red. And they basically go home and have to self-quarantine. And then anyone they've been in contact with now get a notification to say you've been in proximity which someone's had the virus. And they've got so many cameras on the street, so it's all done by face detection. So they know if you're out and about and even like, to leave your apartment, you can't leave your apartment without getting your face scanned. So they know where you've been, if you have the virus, who you've been in proximity of, who has had the virus. And mm -hmm. even in like um, shopping malls and things like that, where only like the food places are open, they temperature check you before you go in there. So they know, and they, they check your phone as well to see like what grade you are. So they know where you can go. And the same with like airports, anyone coming into China has to self quarantine for 14 days. And then after that, uh, and and, it, and it's crazy because like when the virus is really kicking off here and there was pl flights coming in from Italy every day, which was like the epicenter in Europe and there was no temperature checks. There was nothing. People are just allowed to roam. And even now in like New York, there's been thousands of deaths as well. And it's like we have that technology in our side of the world. We're just not allowed to implement it. Yeah. And I mean, you can't look. Look at the way it is. Like I would 
I, I don't believe in an any state. I feel I believe in free, free voice, free will and stuff like that. But in times like this, I mean, how long did it take to flatten the curve over in China? Because they cleaned up in 12 weeks, didn't they, or so? Yeah, yeah. So, so three, uh, three months, it's pretty much like everything is back to normal now. Retail stores are open. And the important thing to note is that China have 42 Apple stores. Uh, sorry, Apple have got 42 uh, stores in China and all yeah. 42 are open. So it's not like China saying, oh, our stores are open again. It's well known. American companies have stores there and they're making the decision to be open. And speaking to my friends there, they said everything is open apart from schools. Right. Uh, Wuhan is still shut down uh, to some extent, but everywhere else is open apart from schools. Right. And um, they never let you know their food and beverage industry suffer either. Uh, they all stayed open, but it was for delivery and pickup only. Yeah. And you know we haven't really done that. Like a lot of places well, um, in the States, everything just kind of shut down and it's now affected a lot of jobs. And it's like, there were so many lessons from how China have done it right, and it's just surprising why we didn't learn from them. Yeah, no, totally agree. Uh, quick hello, Chris Davey. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Just joined the call. Yana is here as well. Silva, in Singapore, we're using uh, Trace Together mobile app to ease uh, contact tracing. See, this is the thing, though. Like, we can't behave ourselves. You know, you're up in Scotland. You've been to, like, the slums in Edinburgh and stuff like that, the council <laughs> states. You know, people yeah, see yeah, yeah. train spotting will know what I mean. we got East London yeah. here, right? Yeah, Them yeah. fuckers ain't going to stay in. It's not yeah, happening. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Not They're problem. unruly. And so yeah. what do you do? It's like you've got um, in China, you've got that nanny state. People just, the yeah. militia turn. I mean, I was in, like, Chris Davey is in the chat here. Chris, post here in a minute. When we were in Hong Kong, we had the militia come in. I was with Chris and a few other people. They come and took our passports away. It was just fucking freaky, three o'clock in the morning. Um, so we don't get that in the UK, and you don't get that over – I know you're, you, uh, Scotland's part of the UK, but what I'm saying you don't get it in Scotland, we don't get that in London. But we had them all fucking sunbathing here in London. Do you know what I mean? They're yeah. walking through the parks and that. And unless we get this under control, unless we bring, you know, more force in – I don't think we're going to get it under the same control as, as quickly as what China did. No, not at all. And we actually supplied some um, some emergency camp beds to the NHS, and uh, we supplied like 500 of them. And yep. so, so someone from the hospital phoned my brother, and they literally said that we have people queuing up who need beds here. Mm. It's like that bad. And what was crazy for me is that so like yesterday or the day before, I flew from LA to London, London to Edinburgh. See, in LA, there was no one in the airport, like no one. There was like five people. You could see everyone who was in the airport, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone was wearing masks. Everyone on the plane was wearing masks. And then when I got to London, it was like not many people were wearing masks. And a lot of people who worked there were not wearing masks or gloves. Mm -hmm. And then I got to Edinburgh, no one was wearing masks. I was looking like an idiot with masks and gloves. Mm -hmm. No one else. No, I, I, and I was shocked. And then like now that I got home, I see people walking down the street and they're not social distancing and they're playing in parks. I'm like, we're off work for a reason, you know what I mean? We're all supposed to stay at home. There's like, I can see loads of cars right now. It's it's nuts. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah. So what, what if you're going to take a punt on it, we're all in at the moment. Do you think, all right, and we're going to get a call next week to say no exercise, no outdoors because of these people have screwed up in the UK. That That's my next step. And if we have to deal with it, we have to deal with it. But I'm hoping yeah. by about June, mm -hmm. we can re return some normality, not fully. Mm -hmm. Maybe our children won't go back to schools and stuff. But um, what's your take on things for the UK? Um, it's interesting. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like a poker hand, right? Where mm -hmm. there's five cards which are supposed to be dealt, but we've only been given the first two. Yeah. And it's like we've seen what's happened, and now it's like we're going to see some more things pretty soon. We just don't know what they are. Yeah. And um, it, it, it's just evolving day by day that whenever like we've tried to make a prediction in the past, uh, yeah. it, it's just been hard. I think the very interesting thing to see would be like, see if anyone who's had the virus and then it's passed through them and they've been asymptomatic and they've not showed any symptoms and then it's gone out of them. It's like, well, those people, because I know there was an NBA player, right? All the NBA players got tested. One guy got tested positive, never showed any symptoms. And then after two weeks, got positive tested and he was negative. So it went out of the system. He didn't even know it. And I wonder, like, how many people are there in the world which have had it, not realized, and it's passed? And, like, for those people, life can go back to normal because I, I was told, I think it's like 99.9% .9 chance once you've had it and recovered from it, you can't carry it again. I'm not right. a medical expert, but th no. that's just what I've been told. Uh, from, uh, I, it's true. That's what I heard as well. Obviously, we don't need, we're not medical. Do you know what is interesting as well? Um, and I'm not saying it is related, 
and I'm at high risk because I've got autoimmune disease. But in January, like from New Year's Eve, right, we all went out um, locally at a village here and someone was like really ill. She's been ill for like 10 weeks, right? Serious cough and everything else. I was sick and in bed from the 1st of January to about the 14th, 15th of January. I had mm -hmm. a fever. I had a dry cough. I had a sore throat. But obviously, it hadn't kicked off in China. Mm -hmm. But I had those kind of symptoms. When I think back to it now, you know, it's like, well, I was in China, uh, like, were you in China? We were in China together, weren't we? But that was like October. November, yeah. Time, November, sorry. So the timeline is completely out, right? Yeah, yeah. It does seem weird. Like what you said, you don't know whether if people have carried this before or whatever. But I had 14 days in bed and I couldn't sleep. I sat upright and I just, you know, when you're just constantly coughing, it's like dry cough all the yeah. way through the night. I'm sleeping half an hour if that uh or maybe an hour you know like in 15 20 minute spurts but yeah. it'd be interesting to know if um if it if it did get out earlier but people just didn't realize you know yeah uh chris says he's in quarantine just now in shenzhen yeah yeah no so and how it ties same he's in he wanted to get to Shen, uh, shenzhen from hong kong i had him on the oh. show in quarantine last week oh no nice. i think he's down to the last couple of days and he'll be uh be out of there but um, yeah, good luck with that, Chris. Hope you and the guys are, are well and um, holding it together. Because if you're in the hotel, a lot of these were put into like Howard's got like a bracelet. He showed yeah. on the show. He said, "Look, I'm wearing this bracelet, and this is the room that I'm in." You know, and it's literally one room. And really? they could, oh, yeah, and it's they could crazy. only, yeah, only all the Uber Eats and stuff. So it's tough. Um, so Chinese are still making tough decisions of mm -hmm. letting people back into the country, obviously. Because obviously, mm -hmm. Chris, Chris is currently in quarantine with his partner and Howard, so they're still being strict on entry. Yeah, and and again, that's the difference as well, isn't it? Like, entry into China requires fourteen days quarantine. Whereas I came mm -hmm. into Edinburgh yesterday, they were like, "Cool, on you go." No one, no one checked anything. Yeah, like, so it, it's insane that we're not carrying out those checks. Yeah, no, it's very bizarre. Um, let's. Do you mind if we? I know we've covered most of the content you want yeah. to cover, but can we start talking a little bit older? Oh, with Chris, what's he saying here? Yeah, look, I had a lot of friends who had the same symptoms in the UK in December and January, same as me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's what I had, but Chris is saying that himself. He, 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 if he's saying it might have been a different strand of something else. So hopefully if, it, if I did catch it, I then didn't pass it on and I'm in quarantine and I can't get it again, that'd be great because I'm literally, I'm, I've been locked down for, a, for like three, nearly four weeks, right? My wife, my daughter's here, barely gone anywhere. I do a walk around the park or whatever. I wear my mask, wear the gloves. Every time UPS or someone's at the door, I've got a big spray. Everything gets sprayed down. Do you know what I mean? I'm like super paranoid of touching anything. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay. So can we uh, can we also talk about what you think people kind of things people should source now? Being this could repeat itself, right? Let's just say viruses is, is the next thing, right? And we mm -hmm. could go through this in another period. And a lot of people have uh, sourced products that are more, less essential. What should mm -hmm. be people looking at? Like if you had a crystal ball, what should they source now to benefit and recession-proof their business in the future? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I feel that, you know, and, and Megla says this as well, is that you should have like a China plus one strategy. So, mm -hmm this first of all like the categories but also where you're sourcing from is important as well because a lot of people are into like supplements nutrition beauty which yeah. a lot of that is done in the states and then you know a lot of products are bought through india as well and it's like when the virus first broke out it was only china and we thought it was only going to be china so like all our manufacturing was affected and then mm -hmm. the people who were manufacturing in other countries were like oh we're good we control our supply now it's affected everyone but i think that like there's virus or no virus there's now been a shift in consumer behavior into more uh, online spending because you know this is our world and we've been operating in this for for a few years but there's a lot of people who still like their traditional retail stores who like you know the grannies who like their meetups and stuff like that and now they're forced to buy on amazon and now they're forced to buy online so they are going more towards that um environment and you know then you start to think what i've been thinking about well how is education shifting because like the education system university system was always quite broken in my yeah. opinion anyway and now it's sort of fixing itself by a lot of online learning and it's like well now what sort of products do these guys rely on and, and what sort of businesses are they going to go into and it's i think any products to do with the home is going to be like way more in demand now like you know like kids uh, coloring in books or like stem toys educational stuff 
um, a- anything to do with like kids in the home and, and education in the home. But the other thing to consider is, well, these products are going to get very, very competitive now as well, because a lot of people are now going to stay away from like travel products because travel as a industry has just gone tanked, right? It's like 95%. Oh, yeah, down. don't worry. I've got a product in, in – I'm in beauty and I'm yeah. in travel. Let me tell you, like, they're non-essential, yeah. put it that way. <laughs> yeah, and, dude, I, I had a travel brand which was supposed to launch in April. Um, right, yeah. I, I was working on it for two years. And I, I at the start, I was really pissed off. I was like, two years of work, and I now I can't even launch. But then I was like, actually, how lucky am I that I didn't launch? Because imagine I launched and then this virus actually took off. But it would have killed all momentum, and it would have just – And all so, the money, the inf- upfront investment for the launch and stuff as well, yeah. <laughs> exactly so i was lucky in that regard but then like i think you also have to look at your competition as well to like what impact does it have on your competition because a lot of businesses this is where there's going to be a massive wealth transfer uh, and anyone who's looking to buy businesses you might want to look at opportunities here where you can buy companies for pennies on the dollar because there's going to be companies which got lucky and you know they scaled very fast but they built their company on a house of cards and they yeah. just didn't operate properly and yeah. now they're not going to be able to pay their their month's rent their fixed costs their storage costs their products aren't moving and that that might be a nice acquisition but people who have done business the right way you know have built a brand have got a sales channel off of amazon um have a community those guys are going to be okay because they can now pivot into other products and people will still uh, demand those products because they like their brand but the ones who haven't and just gone for like the you know the drop shipping model are in a lot of trouble so yeah. i think as well as like the products and the categories you have to evaluate the way you do business as well and mm-hmm. lean more into the branding side of things and off of amazon strategies which i think we're going to be talking in about On friday, friday as well, right yeah 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 so. we'll cover that and that's the other thing where that there's that obsession with the ru- the run the rush to seven figures right yeah, so some yeah. people are going to leverage themselves they're not going to have any cash in the bank in a time like this leaves them stuck because mm-hmm. if they're selling non-essential goods their, their stock's not selling and they've obviously got their money tied up in their stock there they've got no cash flow because they've what they've done is they've leveraged their um their cash flow over a period of time you know that some people live on the edge didn't they they've got cards yeah. running and everything else because they're like growth 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 and they won't leave any f- money in the bank because they're thinking they're being really clever what they're doing because they can project everything but what they didn't see is a global crisis and i think this mm. is the time if you were smart and didn't go so hard that you left money in the bank then mm-hmm. you're going to be all right. But otherwise, it's going to be a, a little tough out there uh, at the moment for people. Yeah, and a lot of companies took investment as well, whether it was from loans from Amazon or outside investment. And now those yeah. people are expecting to get paid back or they're expecting a certain return. And yeah. if you can't do it, then you're going, to get, you know, you're going to lose equity in your business or you're going to get a lot of uh, financial pressure put on you as well. So yeah. you have to look at your financial structure as well to make sure that you're covered in, some, in a time like this as well. Yeah, makes sense. A uh, question here from Bob Dan. Kian, from your experience, what kind of margins do Chinese suppliers target? We're always torn in negotiation prices on how low we can go in order for our suppliers to be content and not sacrifice on quality, but without overpaying for products either. How do you balance that and what are the best practices? That's a great question, Bogdan. So I think, um, first of all, understand if you're buying from a trading company or a factory, because trading companies will quite often uh, place a slightly higher margin than you would get from a factory, but still dealing with trading companies are okay, uh, depending on the service that they provide you. But the best advice I could give is really educate yourself on the market price of your product, Mm -hmm. because quite a lot of people just go to different suppliers and say, what's the price of this? What's the price of this? What's the price of this? But what you have to know is like what you really want to buy and you have mm-hmm. all that information listed in a specification sheet so in a spec sheet you know you're writing uh, the materials the dimensions the fabrics the weights yeah. um the, the tests all that sort of stuff and then you give that same information to many different manufacturers whether you meet them at the canton fair or on alibaba and then your prices start to come back and you see okay ten dollars ten twenty nine eighty and then you really understand what's the market price so you know how far you can push them in terms of negotiation because like if you're getting these prices around ten dollars and then you say seven dollars nine out of ten of them will say no way and one of them will be like okay no problem but the one that said okay no problem is going to take uh, manufacturing shortcuts to get you your price because yeah. we always say in china you can get any price that you want but you there's certain reasons why you're getting those prices so you have yeah. to really 
educate yourself on your product and you do that by knowing exactly what you want in a specification sheet sending that to as many suppliers as possible understanding the market price and then you can make an educated decision of what is the real price yeah. and how far you can take it down well he's gonna say i'll call that a bill of materials so you get a breakdown of everything like i've had open book with suppliers before we know because that's how we've taken um elements away from a product you know like additional zips and uh mm -hmm. over casing on on certain products and then you realize is where all your money's going so doing a bill of materials and understanding what the individual costs are and allowing that the profit uh the the factory's got to make a profit that gives you great insights of your negotiation as well because you might find that there's a product that you think they're overpricing but there's a certain part of the material or the way it's exactly. stitched where it's done manually which mm -hmm. is then sending the cost up like doing something manual as you know could end up increasing the the overall cost by about 30 40 percent versus the the other items and you might actually be like double stitching on something you took that out of the equation because no one sees it but it's still yeah. Quality, it can drastically reduce your price as well and, and, and that's a great point and that's why the bill of materials is so important so on, on the specification sheet like i've got different tabs and bill of materials is one of those tabs but to your point is that if you look at like an outdoor furniture chair right mm. it can be steel tubing or it can be aluminium tubing they both mm. look the exact same uh, mm. but one's a lot lighter and also more expensive mm. so if you haven't stipulated on your bill of materials okay is it steel or is it aluminium but also what grade of steel is it what's the thickness of the diameter on the steel you mm. have to be quoting like for like because one supplier might be quoting for steel which is double the thickness of the other one yeah. so that's why the spec sheet is so important and that's why there's differences in prices and the more clear you can be the more accurate price you'll get back mm. uh, to follow up we are seeing some chinese sellers sourcing at the same suppliers as we do that sells much lower prices. So we're always wondering if they're just getting a much better pricing or settle for such low margins. Suppliers deny the better pricing part, of course, and we believe to have two plus years strong relationship with them. I'll answer that as well, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. In the, a lot of Chinese sellers that are, because they're up to last year, there was a lot of handouts. You could get money from everywhere, right? And the Chinese will go like into the red for a long period of time to win on ranking. So where you might think that your their products, they're getting it cheaper, they're not. They're just willing to give up margin or lose money over a longer period of time to rank the pro, pro, uh, products to grandfather in. They're using the advantage of having cash flow over other sellers. That could be one of the reasons as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and, and that, that's a great point. And also think about the volume that they're purchasing as well, because you, know, you might be ordering 1,000 pieces, you might be ordering 10,000 pieces, which are completely different uh, pricing structures. So that could also go into it. And then you can also leverage economies of scale depending on who else you're supplying because some of these Chinese sellers, they might be selling on other platforms like Taobao, JD, which are their local domestic Chinese uh, online sales markets. And in those markets, they might be selling much higher volumes and they're just sort of adding their Amazon order onto the back of it. So they might, they might be getting very good pricing because their volume is a lot higher, but we'll yeah. never really have visibility of that. Yeah, uh, Ray says here, our trouble is we can't restock due to Amazon's ship, uh, stopping shipping of inventory of non-essential items. Any thought, thoughts when it open? I actually sent some beauty products in day before yesterday, whereas before, when it came to the 5th of, what was it, the 5th of March, was it, when they shut everything down, I couldn't load a, a shipping plan at all. So go and have a look and see if you can raise a shipping plan. You may be surprised because um, – I know that Amazon hasn't made any official announcements, but I was able to ship uh, some non-essentials. Go on. Uh, and so, so this is not really my area of expertise, but obviously mm -hmm. the first thing, uh, try FBM. But the other thing is that I noticed that it was a lot of the smaller and lighter products that were getting shipped out of Amazon, but the bigger mm -hmm. and the heavier ones were not. And yeah. I was wondering wh wh why is that? But then I realized that like, I think they have a rule that any carton which is over like 17 kilograms has to be lifted by two people two That's people right. are now in proximity of each other so yeah. two people can't pick up this uh, yeah because you so. yeah, they're not observing the two meter rule yeah makes yeah, sense so, so oversized products which was bread and butter oversized products was the protection mechanism against yeah. heavy uh what's the word for it heavy competition is now yeah. definitely work against you because obviously people two people can't uh pick it up yeah Makes sense. Um, we're coming up to 43 minutes now. Is there anything else you want to cover? Guys, if you want to pop any more questions in for Kian, I'm happy to uh, to get them answered. Oh, yeah. Owen Burroughs is saying 15 kilograms, he's saying here. Nice. I like Going the last one. Yeah. Um, do you, is there anything, any parting wisdom you want to finish on the talk, Kian, yourself? 
And again, sort of going back to what I said earlier, communication with the manufacturers is key because they might have a quarter of the workers that they had before. They might be doing different products than they were doing before. Uh, they might be in financial trouble. So uh, communication is absolutely key. And just let them know you're here to support them as well because they'll be there to support you in your time of need as well. So just keep that dialogue open, WeChat, voice calls, picture messages, whatever you want. And this is a very good time to strengthen those relationships as well, uh, yeah. which is going to just bode well in the future. Cool. In the comments here, Adam have uh, Amazon have limited to 15k max per box on our last shipment. Ben is saying I'm seeing some windows open this afternoon that were closed this morning for non-essential. So it's good to go back in, check, maybe try on different browsers because the validation and stuff as well uh, depend on uh, what computers that you're using and see if you can load in the shipping plans. Obviously, select the products and then send in inventory uh, and see what happens there. Um, um the, the the final thing i was going to say as well yeah. is um you know tomorrow's call is going to be about freight forwarding and logistics yeah. and yeah. it's very very important to understand how much your freight is costing you right now so just a little teaser for tomorrow uh yeah. tune into that but like as a result there's a lot less capacity and freight costs are going to go up freight forwarders are feeling the squeeze as well so if yeah. you've done your costings before on a model that uh, you think you're bringing it in at a certain price, well, it might have just doubled the cost of you bringing it in. So check your costings and tune in tomorrow as well. Yeah, good. Chris has made a good point. I forgot about this. Go into inventory, inventory planning. It shows which items you can ship on the screen. So you haven't, do any, haben't got to do any guesswork. Uh, Cy B has said, don't forget that the Chinese don't want to lose face and therefore unlikely to admit that they are in trouble. Try to a different approach to the subject. Uh, Tiffany says, thank guys. What else have we got here? Oh, here we go. Roger is saying, how is Neymar these days? Uh, he's great. He's doing good. Uh, you know, it's interesting, right? So we got that Neymar post, I don't know, about six weeks ago or something. Mm. And he was just supposed to post it on his Instagram and put the link in his bio because the company is uh, Active Dreamers, which were, uh, which we're doing all the Neymar products through. But the link in his bio is still activedreamers.com. He's just, he posted it six weeks ago and he's forgot to remove it. So we're still getting a lot of traffic uh, <laughs> thanks to Neymar. <laughs> so Excellent. it's cool. No, it's, cool. it's going good. Yeah, thank you very much. Cool. Let's get some people going into your group as well. So Sourcing with Kian, you can see it on the ticker going across the bottom of the screen. Search on Facebook, Sourcing with Kian. What is the best way that people can reach you as well, mate? Uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so Sourcing with Kian, if you've got any questions about sourcing, I try to answer them within 24 hours. Uh, any questions, just pop them in there. I do the occasional live call as well like uh, like this. And mm -hmm. then also for the more social side of things, I'm a lot more active on Instagram, which is just Kian underscore JG. Uh, in there, I post a lot of stories and what I'm going through. And, uh, and I've tailored my content a lot more educational now as well. So mm -hmm. um, I post a lot of IGTV videos now, just like little two minute snippets of little tips and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, let's chat on Instagram. Let's connect there. Cool. I uh, just want to give you a roundup. So Tuesday, 7th of April, which is tomorrow, Corona Premiums, Logistics, and Air Kian will be joining us back with a few others. And then Wednesday, the 8th of April, we're going to do a roundup what's happening on Amazon this week. Thursday is going to be entering Europe on Amazon, the pros and cons in the pandemic. Friday, the 10th is a co-brand, awesomers.com versus seller sessions. We're going to do diversifying off Amazon with Steve Simonson and, of course, Kian and a couple of others. Saturday is going to be Women of Amazon Part 4, and then Sunday is our Mindset Day, and this one we're going to talk about vision. Other than that, guys, stay in, stay safe. I'll see you back here same time tomorrow. Kian, thanks to you, and guys, Excellent. thanks to everyone who's syndicated to all the groups. Thanks for sharing in the community. Take care. Lots of love. See you soon. Ciao, ciao.